With a career spanning over 23 years and after overseeing over 200 executions, the name John Ellis has become synonymous due to the nature of his work. Today, my friends, we are visiting Rochdale Cemetery to tell the story of John Ellis. Now the story of John Ellis has become somewhat sombre over these passing years ever since his death back in 1932 and out of all of the executioners we could name his story is perhaps the most tragic of them all and like I said at the very beginning he served as the chief executioner for around 23 years he oversaw 203 executions now at the time when he was doing his job as the chief executioner he embraced it he embraced that role but as the years went by he would begin to question if what he was doing was right or wrong now i'm not saying that he questioned every single execution he was about to undertake because he was a meticulous man and john ellis would Many a time, he would read the newspapers, and we'll get more into that shortly. But he would read the newspapers about the crimes and about the people he may have to execute at some point towards, obviously, the, the verdicts of guilty being given for that crime. So he wanted to get as much information about the people involved and about the person, the murderer or murderess, before obviously he undertook that job or that role. He was meticulous, like I said, he wanted all the evidence, but it was a job he would embrace. Hailing from the mill town of Rochdale, where we are currently today, Ellis, now he had become an unlikely candidate for the role of the state's hired killer, for want for a better phrase. And he had, in fact, attempted during his early life to escape the monotony of his upbringing as a barber. And he wanted adventure. So as a younger child or teenager, he ran away twice from his family home. Now at the age of 22 and in 1901, he would make an unexpected decision in his life and apparently it upset his wife at the time and i think he was married at that time but i'm sure it upset his uh, or his future wife at the time as well as his mother and he applied to the home office to become an executioner now obviously because of his background of being a barber um it obviously was one would argue, a bit of a career change. Now, he was invited to undergo training at Newgate Prison, and he would develop his skills that would lead him to become the country's senior executioner. Now, from all accounts, Ellis himself was noted, and it was said by many people, that he was a discreet kind of character. He was always respectable. He was conscientious. He was also sober, which obviously <laughs> plays a big part in becoming an executioner. But all these traits that people saw in him 
over the years would slowly evaporate and Ellis himself would become traumatised by things he had seen and done throughout his career. And we'll touch upon that a little bit more further as we get closer towards where his grave is. But yeah, in the early days of him becoming an executioner, and like I said, during the training, he embraced the role, like I said, right at the very start. It was a, it was a role that was challenging, but ultimately rewarding for a young John Ellis. Now I touched upon the fact that John Ellis was meticulous. And he was. Before he would do the role of the executioner and obviously take another person's life, he would read newspapers and he would scrutinise everything that was in print about that crime. He would also attend, I'm not sure if it was all of them, but he would most certainly attend quite a few of the trials themselves. He would actually go and sit in the boxes and listen to what was being said because Ellis, he was a man that he basically wanted everything to go right. He wanted all the facts before he would do anything. And when you consider the nature of his job and taking another person's life, you can understand why. It's, an, it's a serious and probably the most serious job that one could ever envision. Taking another person's life wouldn't come easy. And like I said, even though he was keen and he embraced it and it was a job he absolutely loved, one could argue, it would slowly evaporate. And like I keep saying, the things he saw, the things he did, by the time he retired, 23 years later, he would become a bit of a haunted man. Now, obviously, Ellis, throughout the course of his career as a chief executioner, he would encounter quite a few infamous characters. None more so than those being Dr. Harley Harvey Crippin, or Dr. Crippin as we now all refer to him. He would also encounter the brides in the bath murderer, George Smith, and another character called Roger Casement, who was involved in the Irish Easter Rising. Now we're not gonna to talk too much, or we're not gonna really talk about any of these cases in today's video because they are stories themselves which are obviously far too big for for today's story so we may cover one or two of these in future videos now there was one famous case which really got under the skin of john ellis and that was the story in the case of edith thompson she was a young lady who by all accounts was married but she was also seeing another man at the time now, when her husband was brutally murdered by her lover, Edith herself had become somewhat embroiled in the case. And obviously, as well as the lover who was committed of murder, Edith herself would also be charged along with her lover and sentenced to death. In the case of Edith, this is probably the, the most horrifying and disturbing execution that John Ellis undertook. She was found guilty along with her, her lover, like I said, of killing her husband. But all the evidence was circumstantial at the time. And there's a mass array of information online if you wish to search for that story and read into it for yourself. But like I said, she would be found guilty of being an accomplice to murder of her husband. And she would obviously be sentenced to death. On the day of her execution, Edith herself was distraught with fear, which you can imagine. She had to be sedated before she could be taken to where the gallows were, or the scaffold were. Stories differ in that she had to be pinned to a chair and lifted and taken to the scaffold. But again, like I said, this is a story for another day. But on the day of the execution, like I said, John Ellis, he would still do his job. And like he always would, he would he would get everything right meticulously. He'd get the weight of the actual person. He would measure the length of the rope. He would prepare everything like he did with all the other executions. Now, when the lever was finally pushed and Edith fell into eternity, it was said that she had vaginal bleeding or hemorrhage, 
vaginally. Some say Edith herself was pregnant when that execution took place, but there is no concrete proof of that. And after that case, women had to wear some kind of canvas underwear to prevent things like that happening again in or during their execution. But this case or this hanging affected Ellis and he told, turned around to a guard straight after and he would say he would never hang another woman again. He did, and I can't remember him, I'll put it down below, but there was another case, I think it was shortly after, where he had to execute another female and he did that job. But at the time, I couldn't understand why he would say it, that he would never hang another female or another woman. Um, but it's a, shocking, it's a shocking example of what can happen during these, these times and these executions. Like I said, the amount of blood that, that was apparent from Edith Thompson's execution. It wasn't just John Ellis who was horrified by it. It was those who were also witness to it, such as the prison guards and perhaps the prison chaplain. But I can understand why it would mess with somebody's mind. Regardless of the truth when it came to the Edith story and if she possibly may have been pregnant at the time of her execution, Ellis himself, he resigned from his position. And he would tell people at the time that it was due to depression as well as alcohol. And I can understand both of those reasonings because like I said, it wouldn't be a job that was for the faint-hearted and it would take a strong character to, to take another person's life in such a way. Now his resignation occurred on March the 15th, 1924. Some argue and wrote stories and articles about Ellis resigning because of the Edith Thompson case and it was that that pretty much made his mind up. But later in life, um, he, did a, he did a newspaper interview and I think it was a Daily Mirror and I've got a screenshot I'll put over here. But he certainly did a, an interview with a reporter and he would actually talk about why he resigned and again stating alcohol and obviously depression for the main reason. And he would also tell the reporter that he had heard the whispers and the rumours that he only retired because of the Edith Thompson de debacle, if you will. But he denied that. He said it had nothing to do with that one case in particular. So you could read into that and say it's perhaps all of the cases, all of the executions that had caused the depression, because it caused the sleepless nights and it caused Ellis to turn to alcohol. John Ellis would continue with executions after the Edith Thompson case and he would do 11 more after that, before his retirement. But it was during his role as the chief executioner, he was still working as a barber. He had his own barber shop at 413 Oldham Road. And he kept this job on simply because the role of an executioner even though it might have paid well for each case, money was not a reliable source or income wasn't a reliable source. So basically it wasn't being paid weekly, monthly or a set salary. It was per case payment. And I think he got paid up to something like £10 per execution plus expenses. And I think it was the assistant executioner, the people who helped him, 
I think they were on something like two pounds and three shillings back in the 1900s. So it was understandable why executioners such as John Ellis had other jobs. Now, even though John Ellis admittedly, openly admittedly, he, had, he would say that he would hate the job as a barber. It was a job he, he couldn't stand, but it was a job he knew. So that's why he carried on his role as a barber at 413 Oldham Road. Now, at some point after, I think it was, was it during or was it slightly after perhaps his retirement, he actually sold his business at 413 Oldham Road and his barber shop to buy a pub. And I think it was over in Lower House, but that didn't go to plan. And he soon relocated back to Oldham Road, this time at number 513, where he would then set up and I'm sure it was another barber shop. I have heard stories and read stories that he also had a news agent. Whether or not it was the one and same, I'm not entirely sure, because there does seem to be some mixed stories out there about his life after being an executioner. Just five months after his resignation, John Ellis would try to take his own life. Taking a gun, he made his way down into the kitchen of where he lived over on Kitchen Lane. But he was that intoxicated, by all accounts, the bullet, when he fired the gun, I think it, it basically hit his jawbone and it splintered. So obviously he was rushed to hospital. His wife and children walk up obviously to, to find him lying on the kitchen floor. So obviously they called authorities and he was immediately rushed to the infirmary. Now a few days later and obviously worse for wear, John Ellis would appear in the Rochdale Magistrates Courts on the charges of attempted suicide because back in that day, back in the, early, the first quarter of the 20th century, suicide was illegal, as daft as that sounds. So John Ellis was bound over for 12 months and he promised, and this is the wording, he promised not to take his life in the same way again. Now obviously because he was no longer a chief executioner and income was really hard coming, Ellis pumped quite a bit of money into a fairground show, or some kind of show I should say. And he would, or he couldn't, I should say, escape the role of an executioner. So he agreed to play a role of an executioner, like I said, in a show called The Life and Adventures of Charles Peace. And this was in December 1927. But it garnered controversy right from day one. And it was all down to John Ellis himself playing the role of an executioner. Now the British public, for the first time in 60 years, they had the opportunity to witness a genuine executioner in action, albeit in stage form. And during one of the shows, he received a spontaneous applause. And he was only on stage for something like 10 or 15 minutes. And all he did was enter the stage place a white cloth over the participant's head, in this case it was obviously an actor, and he would stand there until the actor re-emerged from under the stage to show that obviously he was still alive, and then that was it. John Ellis would obviously leave the stage. Now he defended, or I should say John Ellis defended the participation, and like I said, he would cite the fact that there wasn't a pension for execution, or there was a lack of a pension for executioners, and he needed to earn a living. Now, Parliament themselves got wind of this, and they labelled it demoralising. They said it was a demoralising spectacle. And although they could do nothing to shut it down, due to the public outcry, the play would close within a week of its opening. Now, obviously, with the the show now being closed down and with Ellis losing quite a lot of his own money, he still had, he still had commitments. He still had his wife and children to look after. And financially, he was it extremely hard. He made the decision to take his scaffold 
on a tour of England, if you will, he went down to Brighton, then back all the way up to North Yorkshire. And he would show people, and I think it was some kind of fairground where he, where he went, but he would show people what he would once do as a executioner. Again, this would attract the attention of the government, but again, they were powerless to stop it, even though it was in such a distasteful manner in which the show was being shown. Ellis, all he wanted to do was provide for his family, but the problem was, like I said, it was causing a lot of uproar. Now, combined with alcoholism, combined with depression, and combined with insomnia, events would spiral out of control, and in 1932, John Ellis would, this time, take his own life. In loving memory of John Ellis of Three Kitchen Lane, Rochdale, who died September 20th, 1932, aged 57 years old. It was in his 58th year when he sadly passed. Also of James William, the beloved husband of Sarah Robinson and son-in-law of the above, who died December 9th, 1943, aged 49 years. I presume this is obviously some relative, perhaps of the daughter or the son of the Ellis family. But this is most certainly the final resting place of the chief executioner, John Ellis. On the day of his suicide, John Ellis had seemed restless. He'd left his barber shop somewhat earlier than normal on the day, and he made his way home back to Kitchen Lane. Whilst he was inside his home, he took a razor and he lunged towards his wife. Now his wife, she managed to fight him off and fend him off, and she escaped from the house. One of his daughters, who was just behind her, she must have stumbled and fallen over, but for sure, she struggled to get out of the house. And John Ellis made a lunge for her, saying that if I can't take your mother's head, I will take yours. Now, obviously, the girl herself, she fought him off, and she managed to get out of the house as well. Now, when the mother came back, but this time with her son, they found John Ellis, and I'm pretty sure the son recalled seeing his father take the, thro the, 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 the razor to his throat at the doorway just as they entered the house. John Ellis died pretty much there and then on the spot. It would all come out that, like I say, John Ellis had suffered for many years with insomnia, alcoholism and depression. We don't know what was going through John Ellis's mind at that point. Perhaps it was years and years of hauntings, if you will, of seeing people on the scaffolding, seeing the fear in their eyes before he put the white cloth or the black cloth over their heads. Perhaps he was haunted by the deeds and the things he had seen and done. And this is why we've called the video the title, The Unsound Mind of a Hangman, because towards the latter stages of his life, he had become somewhat unsound of mind. And if we want another insight into the mind of John Ellis, just months before his suicide, during another interview, he would tell 
the reporter um, that basically the stresses of the job of a hangman and obviously all the economic challenges would be extremely difficult to to live by but it wasn't just economic it was also his, his lifestyle and he told this journalist that people do not realize the jeers and insults which a hangman has to put up with in company some people get up and won't sit in the same room with him that itself must have weighed heavily on not just john ellis but also that of his wife and the rest of his family because everybody knew what he was doing when he was leaving his business and leaving his home for days at a time to travel to places up in Scotland, down to Manchester, down to London, to perform these executions. The body of John Ellis was brought here to Rochdale Cemetery on the 24th of September 1932. From all accounts, there were several hundred people, mourners, who came here to pay their respects. But his legacy, his life, one would argue it will always be remembered and not for the positive reasons. He wrote a biography, The Diary of a Hangman, and you can still buy it now. It's on eBay and it's on Amazon. Please, if you can afford it, go and purchase that book because it's an interesting read and again it's an insight into the mind of what John Ellis was going through during his career and obviously after his retirement but it's a sad story and like I said it's a sombre reminder of just what what can go through the human psyche if you will of what of what at his line of work especially taking another person's life or people's lives what it can actually do to the human mind and like I said, depression, alcoholism, insomnia, all these three things. And I dare say there were other factors which led towards his suicide. But it's a sad story, but it's one I'm glad I've covered. I'm glad I've come here to Rochdale 70 finally to pay our respects to John Ellis. So that is all from here at Rochdale Cemetery and I do hope you folks have enjoyed today's story. It's one I've wanted to cover for quite some time but many other creators have also covered the same story. But we've done it, we're here and we've paid our respects to John Ellis. Now comment down below on your thoughts on executions and hangings. Were they a good deterrent? Are they a good deterrent and should they be brought back in today's society and especially with the way the world is now going? We hear it all the time, murders. We hear of child murders, such as the Lucy Letby case recently. Should executions be returned? Tell me your thoughts down below on that, guys. I know it's a topical subject, and I know it's political, and I know some people, they are completely against the idea of bringing back executions, but tell me your thoughts down below. Now, in the meantime, we're gonna leave Rochdale Cemetery because we do have another story to tell here in Rochdale. And funnily enough, John Ellis himself is also part of that story. He was the executioner of the person in that story. But I don't want to give too much away in this video. So I want you to take care, guys. As I always say, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. And like I said, don't forget to comment on this story. Don't forget to share the video. Share it. It does help make me and Vicky and the channel grow. And we do really appreciate it. And we never take it as a given. We do appreciate all the support that everybody does show us. But in the meantime, guys, like I said, take care, look after yourselves, and we will be back soon with another tale from a dark, but at times, glorious past. Take care, everyone.